Welcome back or welcome to the Success Times Happiness podcast. I am your host, Richard Thompson, and today we have an amazing guest, Richard Burrows. Richard has uh, an incredible history um, as a secret agent turned mindset breathwork uh, guru uh, and has certainly helped me in the last year really um, dive deep into my psyche and I guess my mindset and trying to become the best athlete that I possibly can and best and best human I, I possibly can. So he's coming into studio today and we're really lucky to have him and, and I hope you can take as much out of it as I did sitting down with him. So um, let's get into it. So talk to, so you're, I would classify you as broadly, uh, for certainly for me in the last, um, what, six or nine months, I would say as my mindset coach. It's, that's a broad term, but you're certainly deep in the breath work mindset place. You say you are forging elite performance under pressure by building resilience and versatility. What does that mean? It's exploring edges, I think. Um, and giving people tools they can use, which are intrinsic, that are going to allow them to, to widen their, uh, their window of tolerance or increase the size of their bucket for, for stress. Because you're only gonna be able to perform at a high level when you can buffer higher and higher levels of, of stress and pressure and, and all those things that come with operating at the highest level of your sport or your business, whatever it is. So, yeah, and elite performance means different things to different people, whether you're an athlete or a business professional or a um, single mum. Uh, the challenges for you might be um, pretty unique to your world, but everyone needs these these skills and these tools to allow them to you know, ride to those higher levels and not be knocked over and have their lid flipped when something goes awry because it's always going to go awry when you, you're chasing big goals. So, yeah, what I do is to ask people to pay attention, to get to know themselves, to get to know their physiology and their psychology and how the two are interrelated and then to start to take the reins themselves, start to take the remote control of their physiology. And a lot of that comes down to, to breath, which I'm sure we'll, we'll touch on a fair bit as we go along. Do you think the idea of high performance or elite performance in whatever space is, how does the, do you think that compared to just regular performance or mundane life is essentially how much risk, or how much stress you're willing to tolerate? Or how does that... How do you go about, do you think, identifying, like, can you be awfully successful without the ability to tolerate stress? I don't think so. Yeah. And it's not, not so much a, an ability to tolerate stress. It's, it's more uh, how you build in that, that buffer between the stimulus and, and your response and how you, <clears throat> um, you know, remain in a calm, controlled, um, you know, really rational position, even when you know, you're in the eye of the storm. Mm -hmm. So it's not so much um, you know, just muscling your way to the, the, the top of your, your field. It's, it's, it's learning to, to dance with the, the stress and dance with fear and, and, and not have them knock you knock you off your center if that makes sense and you never we haven't always been at this space no doing this work no I'm, I'm a relative newcomer i guess i mean throughout my life i've pursued um you know sport and professional occupations which have put me under a lot of pressure talk to me about that yeah um so i played semi-professional australian rules football and just by look small forward. <laughs> no, uh, started on ball and finished my career down back, okay. as as you do once you develop wisdom and uh, <laughs> ability to read the play. But you know, I'm you know five foot ten and seventy five kilos, so I was never a physical specimen, and always had to work really hard to to get the most out of myself mm -hmm. with my sport. 
So every every inch of performance I could get out of training, I would chase. So I've always had that inquisitive mindset around how can I get better? How can I um, take a pretty ordinary um, body set and, of tools, yeah, set of tools, and, and get the most out of them? Mm-hmm. Uh, professionally, in my my first job out of uni, I joined the Australian um, Security Intelligence Organisation uh, as a you know, green twenty six year old. What drove you that way to go to ASIO? Oh, just you wanted to be a spy. Pro- probably Hollywood. No, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think just the fascination for um, yeah challenge and. Uh, I mean, I'm fascinated by challenge, yeah. but I'm not going to ASIO. University opened my eyes to the, the world of um, you know, international relations and history and politics. So I always had a really strong sense of our, our, our kind of position in history and what, what was you know, the, the big issue of the day, what was of, of great relevance today. And you know, as, as I was going through university, we had 9-11, we had the Bali bombings. And you know, for a time there, I, I couldn't really stop thinking about those, those kind of issues. Um, and you know, a desire to want to live a life of significance and contribute some way and be of, be of service and you know, test yourself as well. So yeah, moved to Canberra. Did a, a traineeship here with a, a great group of guys and girls. And um, did you think that's, was there a pivotal moment? That, like I said, it was patriotism, or was it just your internal ego of wanting to do something different yeah. and wanting make to a difference? Wanting to see whether, first of all, I could measure up, mm-hmm. because it seemed like yeah, you know, there's a bit of a mystique around what intelligence officers do and. The, the kind of challenges they're they're placed under, and you know, the I imagine it's long trench coats and fake oh, moustaches all, all, yeah, all day, every day. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you're not wearing it today. <laughs> I wouldn't have known you. Yeah, but uh, but to see whether I could uh, had what it took to yeah. actually do that job and do it well. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, it took a long time to get in. Mm-hmm. A good twelve months of, and, and even the process of actually getting into do your psychometric testing to, to go and do assessment centres to then be interviewed by psychologists and background have, check have yeah. ten years of your your checkable history bank statements relationships you know all your friends getting interviewed about you that's um yeah it was it was pretty pretty full on wow uh, but just the the learning I got out of I didn't didn't spend a long time in that career it was five years. Uh, I went straight into uh, intelligence operations, collection work, so managing human source operations. What does that mean for the layperson? Uh, getting people with access to information to go and find it for you. So members or of the community or of a respective group, you're basically recruiting them to go and spy on their mates for you. They know that? Yep. And are we talking in, in Australia or are we talking overseas? Both. Yeah, right. Yeah. Most, mostly in Australia. Okay. Uh, so it's, it's finding people with the, the access, the motivation, the availability and ability to, to do the job. So you've got to identify those people. How, big's the, how long is the vetting process for that person? Uh, it, it, it can vary. Okay. But, um, yeah, it's, it's detailed. You've got to make sure that their motivations are. Well, you've got to understand what their motivations are. Sure. Um, and then you've got to get to the point where you can test them uh, to see whether they're up to it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you can have various feedback available to you from other sources to find out how you know trustworthy they are. Yeah. And then you're essentially running them back into a group of interest mm-hmm. um, to you know, provide you with intelligence, mm-hmm. provide you with information. So it's. It's all about rapport. It's all about building relationships. It's all about influence. Um, yeah, finding the motivation and causing the behaviour. And did you find at that point, obviously that's varying levels of stress for you. Did you find at that point of your life that you had that level of, 
I mean, presumably ASIO is working with you on that side of stuff to control and help you with that. But did you find an interest in that at that point? Because that's a fairly stressful, Yeah, I would imagine, more stressful than most occupations. Yeah. Or I would, it's Either way, it's a stressful occupation. So is that something that you were cognizant of back then in yeah, terms I of think it, helping yourself through that? Mm, I think it you know, unfolded on the job. Mm. The, the lessons that you take out from a particularly, um, you know, high stakes um, meeting or you know, operation you're involved in, and and feeling the, you know, the ner- the pre match nerves, mm-hmm. and, and how how you get that under control, knowing what works and, and what doesn't, and you know, learning by the mistakes as well. Um, you know, thankfully, there weren't any colossal uh, stuff ups, but um, still here. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I mean, you're dealing with with people's lives because people are trusting you mm. to keep them safe and protect their identities, mm. and uh, yeah, it's it's a responsibility you can't take lightly, and you can't say, "Oh, I wasn't feeling it today." Sorry, mate. Yeah, um, you, drop you, the ball. Yeah, you, you literally can't drop the ball, mm. and at times it can be a matter of you know, paddling madly under the surface to to maintain that composure. Um, above the water, mm-hmm. uh, trying to you know, balance uh, your objectives with the knowledge you have um, when you go out uh, on pretext interviews where it's, okay, I'm, I'm going out telling this person that I'm interviewing them for this reason, but really it's for this reason. Um, how do I make that jump um, within a conversation? How do I make that segue mm. uh, all the time, you know, staying natural and relaxed and friendly. Um, the, the mental um, acrobatics that go on is, is, is really, really fascinating. And do you think with the tools you have now in that space, you'd be a better? Oh, way better. Yeah. yeah. yeah when you think about what you knew about life and sure. the skills you have when you're 26, oh. 27. Yeah, it's crazy that you even interview 20-year-olds. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, my housemate, and we went through together. He was he was twenty one, and I. It, it's um, he got through remarkable, yeah, and he's he's still still doing very well. Yeah, right. I'm quite senior now, but um, so five years through that process, why? What caused you to go? That's yeah. hang up the cloak and the mustache. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was quite fortunate to to land in a really good team doing some of the most important work. I think at the time in the, the counter-terrorism space. Mm-hmm. And so I was, I was posted out to a collection office. I was in Sydney, um, you know, doing the, the most fun part of the job. Uh, I extended for a year. I uh, was promoted to, to lead my team at the end of that uh, that time. And there's an expectation that once you've you've served your, your time in collection, you'll go back and do analysis, that you'll go back to Canberra and you'll... Sit in the office. Sit in the office, and you'll you'll be a more well-rounded case officer. That, that you'll um, see the other side of the house. Sure. Had no interest in going back to Canberra. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I was, yeah, living in Bondi. Um, <laughs> yeah. Flying around the world. Um, yeah, just having a great time. A couple of the guys I went through with and early mentors had also moved on, and that kind of um, knocked a bit of the wind out of my sails. So I thought, you know what. Let's just pull the ripcord. Yeah. Without any plan whatsoever. <laughs> and that's it? Yeah. Yeah. So you're in Sydney and yep. just said, I'm done. Yep. I'll figure it out. So went via the UK first. Okay. Uh, got back into some executive search. So when I was at uni, one of my part-time jobs had been as a research associate for a headhunter. Mm-hmm. So I went from recruiting... Um, Extremists. Operatives. <laughs> to, to recruiting chief executives. Friendly, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I wound up in the UK and, and got Which myself. I imagine is a very similar skill set other than oh, you yeah. don't feel like your life's at risk. No, that's right. <laughs> it's, um, yeah. It's, um, it's, it's relationships. It's assessment, trust. It's assessment and cultivation. That's yeah. except essentially what you're doing. Because in selling a or filling a CEO role, mm. you, you're as much um, selling as you are buying. You've got to convince someone who's sure. well paid mm-hmm. to move, really happy in what they're doing. You know, why would they possibly give that away to you know, risk to the unknown? A, yeah, on yeah. a new role. So, uh, yeah, did that in the UK for a while, and then when I came back to to 
Australia. My very first boss when I was working at uni was starting up a new firm and asked if I wanted to be involved and, yeah, almost eight years later, still involved but mm. remotely, yeah, okay. which, is, which is nice. Yeah. How do you, on that point of like um, trying, not convince, but trying to talk to someone to leave what is stable and known to how do you I guess personally how do you look at that in terms of and I guess you you went into that intersection when you left ASIO because the unknown was significant I had no idea what was going to go after that but uh, Nick Quinn my good friend uh, my best mate sent me something the other day and was like this uh, it's like present state numbness where you just quite there's so many people that are just like and I think people are on this trajectory of life or this l- place of life where they're like, this is fine. <clears throat> I'm not going to pursue a career in singing because I'm 45 and that's just not something that, that cut out for me. But there is that unknown. And I guess if you're passionate about a certain thing and you want to go after it, that's great. But then how do you personally look at even where you are now and you're headed towards obviously less headhunting C-suite recruitment and more towards breathwork mindset, helping people in that space. But there are infinite, the opportunity cost of your time and energy is infinite outside of what you're doing. And so, and, and so is the potential, the upside of what it could look like. Mm. So how do you, how do you arrange your house internally to think, and how often do you assess that to go, actually, I want something different or I want – I you have this goal of where you want to be in X amount of time, but how often do you pivot and how often do you reassess whether or not you're on the right track for that? Daily, I think. Yeah? Yeah. I've, I've still got no idea what the ultimate destination looks for – looks like for me in this space. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> but I always – remember times when I was sitting in offices with my executive search colleagues and looking at the guys who were 20 years ahead of me in that space and realising that I didn't want to look like they look like. So it's almost like the the alternative, like the alternative bias or like the alternative options is easier to cross out. Yeah, this cross is what out, I don't, don't want. want. Yep. So therefore I need to keep looking yep. or it'd be not, that, not down this path. Yeah. Well, let's let's head more in this direction, mm-hmm. and and this this is this is kind of what makes sense to me. This is what in, inspires curiosity and passion. So let's head in that direction, and then we can course correct along the way. Yeah. So yeah, I think it's a daily process, and I still wake up <clears throat> some mornings and think, "Geez, what am I what am I even doing? Yeah, I need to forget about this area of focus or or this um, style of, of trying to reach meet the market and mm-hmm. go." different direction Jordan Peterson talks about that because I think there's a lot of people that sit in that numbness or that it's almost like they're just treading water and they're just going this is fine Mm. I'm not going to stress myself or push myself limits and Jordan Peterson talks about that you it's less of a concern about where you're headed but more about the application of where you're of of the direction Mm. so what you're doing you, you know, you go toward, you're, you're angling towards a certain position, place in the future. And you're, it's the skill set that you're putting together to do that yeah. is more important than where you're headed. Because you might not know where you're going or you might pivot, but it's the same skill set you need once you realize, ah, oh, this is where I need to be. Yeah. And it's not a matter of, well, I won't try. I won't put like the all in approach or, mm. you know, the, 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 the marginal gains or, just the full focus or full attention on something, you're better off doing that at, and, and aiming for something you're not sure of than not aiming it at all and not, not applying those yeah. things. Because once you then go, actually, I want to review old um, spy versus spy comics and have a blog, right? That's that's my that's that's my dream. Found my niche. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. Yeah. It could be a wide thing. I don't know. Spy versus spy. They were in the Mad Magazine. Yeah, yeah, they? yeah. yeah. Um, in the eighties, eh? <laughs> <laughs> but if that's your goal, you need to have already curated 
the applica- the tools to apply yourself wholeheartedly at something. Mm. And Otherwise, if, you, you're starting from zero. And yeah, and you you don't know whether or not you can actually apply yourself. Mm. So, I guess that's uh, you know what you have done since leaving ASIO is to go. I don't know where I'm going, but I'm applying myself a hundred percent with what I'm doing mm. always to areas which interest me. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. And and that might change. Do you, uh, you? Yeah, that may change. Yeah. And that's, I guess, um, that scares me because you've, like, particularly on a, on a physical level, on a sporting level, you and like any other any sportsman, you've you work really hard at your craft in that space of I'm going to put everything into this, and then as soon as you stop being a sportsman at a high high level you basically you've still got the tool set of how to apply yourself and i and i have confidence in that in myself into with business or with other, otherwise but you are shelving a huge part of your toolkit oh it's a huge investment in in time you know, time and identity <clears throat> yeah and and this is who i am this is what i do am i prepared to walk away from that um, cuz there will come a time when it has to come a time yeah yeah other than then being thrown off you know, being collected by a bus tomorrow. Yeah, unless you're Kenny Powers and you <laughs> <laughs> play in the minor leagues. Yeah. Um, and there are a few people like that. <laughs> There's a few triathlete, tri- like ex-pro triathletes yeah. still rocking around at 60, um, being the heroes of their lunchbox, you know. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's it's more about self-acceptance and, um, then, the, and then the hunger to go do something else um with the same desire and same mm. um determination but you're not gonna that's a poor word but it, you know you it will take a, a, you know i've been in the sport for 20 years and i found my niche and what works with my body just adapts really well to that sort of discipline and mm. there's it'd be lucky very lucky or i don't know whether lucky is the right verb uh, adjective but um fortunate to find something else other than sport that I can dedicate to that I I'm that good at to be the world's best mm. in that next level next and that's maybe that's what drives you yeah but anyway um so for you at the moment what does success look like for you how do you define success for yourself Success is a tricky one because it implies there's a, there's a goal, an achievement of that goal. Um, at least the way I think about it. I'm thinking more in terms of um, less of a linear process as I'm getting older. You know, I need to achieve X or you know, reach this milestone and more about the kind of values that I'm wanting to, to live. Uh, and I haven't really reflected much on this until I've got to, you know, my, my 40s, is, you know, what are my values? And the two I keep coming back to are curiosity. So if I'm not living in a way which is aligned with learning new things, testing myself in new scenarios, um, mentally, physically, spiritually, all of the above, then I'm not living a successful life. And the other one is, it's probably been threads of it throughout my life, but I've only just coming to realise it now is, is service aspect. Am I doing something which is making somebody else's life better, safer, you know, more enjoyable? And just the, the reward I'm, I'm getting out of that compared to just doing something for, for money, like search work, which you know, can be pretty lucrative, which is great. You know, looks after the family, but uh, doesn't have anywhere near the same kind of intrinsic reward as seeing someone's tra- transformation um, when they come out the other side of a serious challenge like the first time in an ice bath and seeing the fear and the story that they're telling themselves about how why they're going to fail before they go in, giving them the tools, seeing them come out the other side and just be a different person. Mm. So that is, look, I feel like, yep, I'm a success now when I can see that happen repeatedly again and again. So... Curiosity um, for myself and service for others are, are the two 
guiding values, which are really coming up again and again for me. How has your relationship been with yourself over your 20s, 30s and 40s? Generally pretty good. Yeah. yeah. I've always been pretty happy in my own company. Mm-hmm. Um, always been uh, you know, quite comfortable being uh, not the black sheep, but a bit con- contrarian at times. I was pretty late to get on social media. I was you know, never really worried about you know whether I had a girlfriend when I was in my twenties. Um, yeah, I didn't feel a need to yeah, prove myself to my parents, anything like that. Um, caused them a, a few headaches in, in <laughs> my years of yeah, doing extra degrees or changing careers and just like following that curiosity. Do you find that came naturally? Because obviously there's pressure there mm. from your parents or there's pressure from society to this is the way you should be going about something. Yep. And you've just gone, it doesn't, that does, none of that, I can shove all that, that expectation or... Uh, it, it still lands on you. But again, going back to that, you know, what am I not willing to tolerate mm. was always way stronger than the pressure. Sure. So yeah. The alternative is way worse. Yeah. Yeah. So it become, the decision becomes pretty easy. Yeah. I was pretty lucky too. My parents gave me some great opportunities in terms of experience and travel when I was in my teens. So I went on a a school exchange as a 15-year-old to the US for two months. Wow. And my host was three years older than me and could drive. So (laughs) road trip to New York and Washington as a 15-year-old kind of opened my eyes to independence and self-reliance. Um, and then the following year went to England for a month to play cricket with the school team. And when I was in university, I um, had to get my marks out of the gutter to qualify for another exchange program, but went to uh, Canada for a year on my own. So, you know, all these opportunities to see the world and to you know, be responsible for your own happiness and your own well-being. And you know, this is an age before smartphones. I remember you know, calling home maybe once a month you had during that time. Um, so really no, got... No news is good news yeah. from the parents' side yeah, of things. that's right. Yeah. <laughs> or here's some photos in the, the mail of me bungee jumping in Switzerland. Yeah, <laughs> I'm fine. <laughs> um, but, yeah, but I think those experiences really you know, shaped mm. who I was going forward that you know, I'm ultimately relying on myself, mm. that I can tr- trust my own judgment, that I don't need... You know, the validation or the, um, you know, the acceptance of, of somebody else, that you're really the one steering the ship. Mm. So go out and make what you want of it. That's amazing. And then if, so those two uh, values for you define success, how do you then, is that, how, how is that linked or what is the relationship between that and happiness for you? So my take on happiness is, um, it's pretty simple that it's just enjoying the passage of time and if you're aligned with your values the activities you're involved in you know, inherently become that much more enjoyable because mm-hmm. there's this, this feedback of you know, reward and you know, giving and you know, it's, it's a nice, um, nice ebb and flow to it but you're yeah, just enjoying the passage of time and, and like I said, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable in my own company. I don't feel like I need other people, um, but I'm equally as happy with good friends or, or family. Um, and it always comes back to, to being in that present moment and not being uh, attached to being somewhere I'm not and, and not projecting forward to, oh, I'll be happy when, mm-hmm. when this happens. I'll be happy when... Yeah, you know, I'm a full time, you know, performance coach and keynote speaker, and you know, and I've got notoriety. I'm, I'm enjoying the process now, mm-hmm. and the more I can get back to the now and perfecting the present, and you know, sitting here with you, how can I suck the most out of this conversation? And then when I go to the pool this afternoon, how can I get the most out of that session with the guys? Um, if you become fixated on on the end goal or um, where you think you need to be, it's I mean, attachment is the root of all suffering, right? So uh, 
I'm trying to keep it simple. I'm trying to, yeah, focus on those values and live those values and, and enjoy the, the process. Do you reflect daily or weekly about your <coughs> ability to stay wholly in the moment? Or I find that, you know, that that's being in that moment is everything, right? It's such an, like negative emotion generally is either it, more often than not is hung up on the past or the future sure. yep. and if there's not a lot of emotion that can occur negative emotion that can occur uh by staying in the moment of all intents and purposes go into the day going yep i'm in the moment and i reached out i messaged you the other day about how um how overwhelmed i felt um and it I don't want to sound like I'm unique because everyone has so many balls in the air and so many emails to respond to and phone calls to respond to or messages and, mm. you know, <coughs> stakeholders in your own life that need attention. Coupled with, you know, you've got a, a baby girl and, uh, you know, and a, and, and a wife and life, there's just so much that you can get overwhelmed with. Mm. And a key message from you was is it was boiled down to is to stay holy reset and stay holeless how can you be more the most present mm. in a moment but i'll go into that into a day and go yeah yeah, yeah that, okay let's do that that's the plan let's we've do, got, we've got, got this, this. yeah <laughs> there's one thing <laughs> if, there's one, <laughs> if there's one thing i'm doing today it's staying in the moment and then by 9 30 you're like it's uh curveballs been thrown yeah, yeah and you're like or not 9.30, God, 7.30. I need mm. to, it's 7.30, I need to pack these lunches and then get these kids to school so I can get to the 8.30 squad, swim squad and that'll get to me to 11 and then I've got this meeting but I've got to make sure that the meeting's at 11.30 and, um, and then I, it's just, and then a phone call rings and it, like how often are you, like are you nailing that or no. are you, or how, and how is. yeah, <laughs> but I mean like how gentle, are, I, I feel like I'm, I feel like you need to be really gentle with yourself. And mm. I, but I also think like you hear people talk about, oh, it's, you know, um, it's a, I'm, I'm tr just improve, trying to be better every day or uh, I'm always trying to, it's, I've always got work to do. Mm. And it's like, so I find sometimes it's a cop out. Like you either just, and that's the polarity of my, of my, sometimes of my consciousness of like, you're either really good at it or you're not good at it. And you've got to be gentle with yourself, but it's not a hard task to do to stay in the moment. Mm. It's what it's technically really, really boil when you boil it down to it, it's quite easy just to stay here. Mm. There's nothing else in the world apart from this conversation. And it's so light, it lightens you, right? But then you just so quickly slip back. Yeah, it depends on the complexity of your life and the stakes that you're chasing because stakes creates pressure and pressure adds to expectation to achieve. Uh, and surprises always come. That's the, the guaranteed. And you know, perhaps the last few months, I haven't been nailing it as well because um, you know, we've had to move house and you know, a few other things have come my way that I wasn't expecting. My training's gone down the toilet and I'm starting to get anxious about that. <clears throat> but I know that you know they will. It'll pass. We'll get back into a into a better position, but just not completely dropping the ball. And, and like you said, being gentle enough with yourself that you'll live to fight another day. And I guess it's different because you're on like a really tight time frame. You've got this. But so, so is everyone. You yeah. know, like I think, and that comes back to. I also feel like every what everyone's going through is all relative to them and mm -hmm. their life. So I couldn't, it's not comparable, comparable like, um, but uh, yeah. Uh, the other thing I wanted to ask you about is, um, for anyone who knows the story about the World Championships last year, I would say you were, you know, 90% integral to that outcome, um, given that I was in such a state after day one and for context, We've never lost a day mm -hmm. in in Ultraman. Jeez, that must have been such a and so to be body in, blow. Yeah, so, to be in yeah. third place, fifteen minutes yeah. behind. Um, 
in a race that we I think we would have we I was expecting to hopefully win by about 15 10 or 15 minutes would be come, would be good to be behind mm. um yeah I was but it wasn't even emotionally spiraling it was phys- like I felt physically I felt cooked mm. and we had changed the program the training program leading into it so I was so, I was probably underdone so mm-hmm. that was there as well and anyway reached out to you overnight because the time difference and a lot I would classify that as some element of trauma mm-hmm. that are, that has been, you know, in the very recent history of a few hours before, that's trauma. And that's how I sort of can relate it to other people. They've exper- everyone experiences trauma and varying degrees, not incomparable to everyone else, right? Someone's trauma is just as, you, you know, your largest traumatic experience in your life is just the same level as the next person's, irrespective of mm-hmm. the subject matter. Because you're only you're only being exposed to what you know, mm-hmm. but I do believe everyone's experienced a traumatic event in their life. And then one thing that hit home to me, or two things that hit home that I'd like to talk about for you to you today is the adage of "get out of your mind and into your body." That was really integral. <coughs> and then the second point was uh, the idea that this is integral to my story. And I found that incredibly powerful. And um, so I'd like to, I'd like you to talk about those two ideas. Um, I guess the first idea with getting out of your um, body and in, uh, getting out of your mind into your body, envelope that with breath work. Mm-hmm. If you can explain yeah. what you do and how that works and, and what we've worked on. But then secondly, uh, the idea of that this is an integral part of your story helped me not, not only that traumatic event, but a lot of the trauma in my life to go, shit, you know what? this yeah. is my story. Mm. And this is all happened for, for a reason because this is an integral part of that story. Yeah. Well, to be honest, it was, it was pretty lucky that I picked up your message. Oh, good. <laughs> we'd, we'd been out, out all day. I was going through a period where I was trying to – Keep my phone away from me as much as possible. So on a Saturday afternoon, just got back in and to actually get those messages, I have to go into Instagram. Mm. So, oh, RT. Because I wanted to sort of check in on, on the, the progress as well because I knew it was happening that day. And then to get that message, um, you know, while we're trying to get a three-year-old's dinner ready. Uh, <laughs> Sorry it, about that. Uh, <laughs> I read it to Beck and, and, and I thought to myself, geez, how do you respond to this? So... Um, yeah. I think I was pretty short as well. I think yeah. the message was like, I'm in a hole. Yeah. Um, Any help would be appreciated. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. I was like, do you want me to call you? Or, oh, yeah. Man. So, yeah, just, just started, you know, riffing on, on what came to mind. And, yeah, having been in, in holes in the past where, you know, I've been doubting the whole enterprise that I've been um, focused on, yeah, what did I do? And a lot of the times it would just be, just start walking. Just get get out and go walking, and and just that the notion of, of movement and you know traveling and you know, making progress um, immediately gets me unstuck. Uh, so that that notion of, of getting out of out of your head and into your body uh, when when you're when you're motionless and you're still, you know, depression and that hates a moving target. So. Uh, the all you can really do is ruminate, and all you can do is is live in your head. And um, when you're not moving, when you're not moving, mm. um, so and, and a lot of psychology works from either you know top down talk therapy or bottom up somatic practices, where it's you know touch, feel, sense, breathe, mm. uh, and the the amazing thing about and breathing and, and why I told you to you know, focus in on a, a particular cadence or um, use some music as well is that it breath sits at that intersection between your psychology and your physiology. Um, centres in the brain which control you know, respiration can be either under conscious control or automatic. And so when they're automatic and when you feel like 
you're on that that spiral, uh, negative spiral, mm-hmm. where there's uh, a state, uh, and your state was probably pretty panicked, anxious. Um, you know, there's a there's a breathing pattern that that might go along with it. It's shorter, it's shallower, it's tighter. But you can take the reins and induce the state you want by inserting a different breathing pattern when it's deep, when it's controlled, when it's powerful. You know, automatically, you're going to feel calmer, more confident, more energetic. So that's why you know, I think breath control is, is so powerful. It's that ability to insert yourself into that cycle between state and emotion and you know, the, the physiological response. Um, that's, that's why, you know, essentially why I do what I do. It's, it's giving people that tool. And then, yeah, this notion of what gets dealt to us as being integral to the story. Um, yeah, I think life just oftentimes provide the universe provides the, the right circumstances at the right time. And for me, I felt like um, you know, what little I did know about your, your history of racing and um, performance was that, yeah, it had always been um, plan, strategy, execute, win. Yeah, yeah this, this is how we do things. Uh-huh. And um, it was 21 days. Oh, it was eight, <clears throat> oh, 18 days of racing since 2017 mm. and we've lost none. Mm. It was, and more the point, to your point, is um, which is executed as per the plan. Yeah. And so there has to be, yeah, you're going to learn a lesson at some point in time. And you know, what better stage and an opportunity to get delivered that message um, and how you chose to respond to that was either going to make or break that race and potentially you know, this career. Mm. Um, and recognising that and embracing it, inviting it in and going, okay, this is the card that's been dealt. Here's my opportunity mm. to become something. Here's my opportunity to transcend everything I thought was, you know, my level. There's 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 more here. Mm. There's an opportunity for me to um, not prove, but to um, yeah, experience a new level of focus, a new level of um, commitment. Because without the a challenge of that nature, mm. there's no way you would have had to rise to that level. No, I agree with that. And I mean, a lot of them, uh, part of the emotion on that night was almost, not embarrassment, but like I couldn't, <clears throat> and even still now, like we had done some work beforehand with breath, with underwater work, with sauna and ice, which <clears throat> was really good. But I was coming from a place of this is going to help me endure mm-hmm. when it gets challenging during the day, during each day. I had no idea that that I, the, the place that I will need it the most is between those days or between day one and day two. Mm-hmm. Um, day one was so so lacking in performance on relative to my own ability that I had to, to promise to myself that I wouldn't jump in the car until the until we finish the day and then we can reassess. I was like, that's the bare minimum. I'll do my best um, and we'll get to the finish and we'll reassess. And to be 15 minutes down and feeling like dirt, like physically, um, with 280 kilometres of riding the next day and a double marathon on day three, it's like, man, this is going to be a long couple of days. It seems insurmountable for you in that moment. Yeah, if, if what are we doing here, you know, and... But to think that the work that we did and the work that you helped me with now is not just about, you know, that whole when the when it gets challenging in, in the race, where does my mind go? But it's it was <clears throat> way more integral to help me manage basically getting up and getting to the start line on day two. Um, and that's that was if you had when did you read that message, by the way? The morning, the, the morning. next morning. So one, one of the first things you first did thing, that, yeah. I was like, not, not, I mean, I'm not a, 
I don't look at my phone <laughs> at all in the, in the mornings, but it was like, fuck, I hope he, I hope he gave me something. <laughs> <laughs> From your bone here, come on. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and I definitely did, I definitely did feel, still didn't feel great. I remember Codes was there and obviously, and the night before, on day one night, he's like, you got this. And it's like, yeah, great, mate. I'm glad you think so. Yeah. Because I don't. I feel like I'm busted here. Mm. Um, and uh, I woke up, did what you know, direct did what your direct your directives were. Um, I did go for a walk the next that morning uh, that evening on day one mm-hmm. before you came back to me or before I even messaged you. Um, but I still felt I was like dragging my feet. I was like, "Fuck, this is the other side of an island of Hawaii. Like, mm. I don't want to be here." But um, Reading that, I was like, okay, we have an opportunity here. And I didn't feel confident that um, we were going to dominate. Uh, but it, I, there was an air of acceptance and to go, okay, but we're still, we're still going to fight today. And that was a hell of a lot better than where I was 12, mm, 12 hours yeah. before. Um, and going back to your point about the training that we were doing, you know, underwater, in the ice, you know, and, and you thinking it's about, you know, enduring and being being tougher and approaching it from that angle. Yeah, I like to refer to ice baths more as cold water or cold exposure or heat exposure and that idea of exposing yourself to something which is much stronger than you are and and seeing what comes up, seeing, you know, what the story is that you create about, you know, why you can't do this or why you're um, suffering, you know, what, what's the story that's running in your head and is that actually the truth mm. or is that serving you in, in some way? Where's that come from? And why are you holding on to that story? And can you change the narrative? Can you take a different perspective? Um yeah, the the opportunity just to be in that that situation where it's it's truly challenging. Yeah. It's pretty rare in in our modern you know comfortable sure. life. Yeah, yeah. We've got everything we need. Yeah. We're never hot, never cold. Yeah. Air conditioned car, air conditioned house. You know, food gets delivered to the door just by punching some buttons on you. Sure. Yeah, that ability to feel exposed and yeah. and, and how you respond. And, and so much of it is is mental and what what story's playing and, and how you uh, how you overcome that I felt ashamed or at least yeah I think ashamed is probably the the best adjective because we had done that work and I'm here I am unable to get out of the hole like I do, I do believe that message and the points you made there were so integral to um, to get me right mentally, and it was frustrating. Not that we did a huge amount of work, but, no, and but it was more just, and it, was, it came because it, it was it came from from behind because I wasn't expecting it to need it yeah. during between the stages. But um, <clears throat> yeah, and then day two happened, and I remember Marcus, the director of the film, um, he obviously saw it, saw everything on that night on day one night and also sat me down and interviewed me and I'm like, this is fucked. I just don't want to be here. And then to be in the car, for him to be in the car to see day two's performance and on day two night to go, oh, by the way, to him, by the way, I messaged Buzz last night and this is his response and he's crying off camera. Yeah, well. Yeah, it was, uh, it was cool. But part of me as well thinks the ability the exposure part, whether that's ice, sauna, life generally mm-hmm. throws a traumatic event or something happens or an email or whatever. What's your thoughts about that, re- the relationship of how you deal with something like that versus uh, the relationship between that and I guess the relationship you have with yourself? Because what I found is that that happened and I am like the biggest critic of myself, not just about, oh, I don't think I can hold this number now for the next 280 kilometers the next day, but it's come on, open the door, give me every single thing that's wrong with me or that's happened because I've 
you know, because of me or like it's almost it was such an opportunity. Like it was exposing myself to every single weakness and I'm, I'm my own – like you're, everyone says you're your own worst critic. It's because you're there mm-hmm. experiencing every failure in your life that no one sees. Well, and certainly maybe your parents know some of them but because they're stuck around but you've got people that come through your life and they don't know – every chink in your armor, mm. but you are, you've had that box seat and you can't lie to yourself about that. You know, every failure you've done. And I sort of feel like if you aren't, if you aren't there to, to accept that or to have done that work to go, yeah, look, I'm, I'm, um, imperfect, but worthy. Mm-hmm. If you're not there, then that exposure will cut you way more, crush you. Oh, yeah. way more, way quicker and mm. way with way more effectiveness than the person who has done that work. Mm. Cause it, I, I had done with the trauma that I've had in the past, I thought I had worked through that. But then obviously when something like that on day one happens, it's like, open the door, come on, come in. back in, come on in, tell me again, how shit, come here, come, Chip come, away at me. Yeah. come back and tell me how shit I am yeah. as a person. Um, all my failings of, uh, in my life and it's – I think it does come back from that place of – and it, it's not – again, you're going you're gonna to say – I'm going to say, you know, it's a work in progress. <laughs> but – which is a cop-out. But um, I do feel like when I feel overwhelmed or I have doubt with anything, that door opens a little bit and it's like your mind goes – yeah, what about this though? What about that? You know, and it's about, and that comes back to being in the moment. Mm. But even like, yeah, I'm talking a lot, but even in the water on the weekend where we did two hours open water, there's no metric initial, like there's no, me- there's a very little metric you mm-hmm. can go whether or not you're nailing the yeah. swim, right? You're not hitting the wall every 50 meters. <laughs> exactly, looking at the <laughs> clock, you're getting, getting that little yeah. pat on the back. <laughs> um, exactly. And, um, and then so your mind goes and, it's two completely different – I mean, maybe let's call it drivers at the wheel. One's your inner critic, one's your inner fan. Mm-hmm. And your inner critic is – you're swimming and you're going, fuck, you're slow. You haven't done the work. What about this? When you were 15, you should have stayed at squad or not even athletic performance. Like it just opens that door. Come on in. And even though you've done that work, you've tried to process through that traumas and the events that have shaped your life – it's still open. Like you, you, you're so vulnerable to that place mm. because you're letting your, your critic control it. Then you, as you say, you bring come back in that moment and you go back to feel, go back to breath, go back and wholly go back into that moment. Yeah. Assuming. Can I feel my, my heart beating in my own yeah. chest? How's, can you visualize the air going into your lungs yeah. and back out? And um, the inner critic goes. There's no yeah. There's there's no possible no, way it, yeah. for them to to maintain space in um, in, in the a, moment. In the moment, yeah. Um, so then the question then to you is, how do we? When you feel overwhelmed, when you feel like those that door is open and your past, or your anxiety about the future, or your problems with your past come up, how do you have the state of mind other than messaging you at? Three, yeah. three in the morning uh, to – because they're coming th- – those events come when you least expect it in a way that you don't expect it always. Um, how do you remind yourself to, to – that you are imperfect but you're worthy when at that moment your critic is at the wheel telling you you're not? That's the, the million dollar question, isn't it? <laughs> I wish there was like a, a succinct sound bite that it yeah, would be the the for. promo for this, uh, this podcast. Yeah. For. <laughs> <laughs> Something we can put on a t shirt. <laughs> when the critic appears, um, yeah, yeah. I, I think you've just got to um, repeatedly practice feeling vulnerable and repeatedly practice feeling or, t- or taking on challenges. And, and learning to respond, learning that uh, what helps and what doesn't and, and tightening up and, and, and letting that voice in and get louder when you put yourself in those situations. Yeah. A great one is um, breath holds in the pool. 
And then we went through just a really simple sequence of, of building up and we got you to two minutes and you were feeling pretty comfortable. I was, I was thinking, yeah, we might go to 2.30 here, but then tapped out at... Couldn't one, get to 90. One, yeah. That was all between the ears. Yeah, it came, it came flooding. The door, that, that door was open. Yeah. Then something came up. A little bit of doubt crept in or there's, there's a sensation physically that you um, focused on and let get out of control and you were, you're gone from there. So putting yourself in those positions and let, inviting that feeling in mm. and you know, practicing how you respond. You've got to practice when, when these situations come up. So small exposure mm. to give you confidence um, – that you have the toolkit yeah. or to learn, I guess, what's best for you. And so you have the toolkit when it gets particularly challenging. Yeah. yeah. As I said to you, it was a shock to me. I mean, and all the traumatic experiences in my life have happened without rhyme or reason or, you know, you don't see them coming. But certainly in such a controlled environment that is my racing, I was even surprised when that came up. I was, as I said to you, I was expecting to use your the, the breath work and the stuff that we've learned in race to be stronger to when it gets when it gets really challenging mm. how do you hold on this for is the last gonna be, half this is going to be my secret weapon yeah for, for the last extra boost, last yeah. four you know 10k of the run yeah um but like anything it happens without you realizing and it's not when you expect it and um yeah i was i felt shit that I didn't even have, I didn't, despite that work, I still fell in the hole and still felt unworthy. Mm. And I mean, even though we spent a fair chunk of time together on that day, I still felt like there was a, a real surface level of um, perhaps buying, you know, because we've got the, the cameras following us around, um, you know, wanting to get the, the right shots, you know, that external lens, I think, takes you out of that, that true internal focus. Sure. So, yeah, sure, you might have picked up some of the, the basic concepts we were working on, but the ability to go deep and to experience that um, at another level, I think, was probably still available to you. Mm. Um, Exposed me. Yeah. Become Hawaii. Yeah. Work to do. <laughs> Unfortunately. <laughs> um, all right. Now, a few... Rapid fire questions. Um, <clears throat> latest song on Spotify that you've played? Is it Peppa Pig or is it? Well, when you've got a three year old, mm. like if you go into my, you know, when you get Spotify, you're in review. Oh, yeah. Dominated by Disney. Perfect. Uh, Frozen. Um, and and can have you watched Encanto? No. No, we've, we've had that on repeat for the last <laughs> two weeks. Uh, but on the drive down, um, my latest Spotify was a bit of nostalgia. I went back to the Cold Roses album from Ryan Adams. Wow, that is good. Which I was listening to a lot uh, in my mid-20s. Uh -huh. um, yeah, just, just something about the... Because I don't get to, to drive by myself that much. Mm -hmm. So just having that on... Um, I forget who said it, but... Then, idea that the music you listen to around about yeah 20 early 20s is always going to have the most resonance the most interesting uh, most sweetness for you mm -hmm. uh, and I actually I Ryan Adams subscribe to that yeah yeah, yeah. fun story of Spotify because I use it with my kids for white noise at night yep um, through Spotify so at the year of year of review <laughs> I was like 99.9 .9. I was within like top 1% of, of white noise listeners. Oh just Spotify users cuz it's on I mean I trained with it. Oh yeah, yeah. But it's on 12 hours well fuck let's let's be honest let's let's 7 hours <laughs> or maybe 8 um a night every night for the year. So it was like you're a hyper user. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it was like it averaged out to be like uh, listening to Spotify like constantly, twelve hours a day. Yeah, I was like, yeah, yeah mine, mine's a weird mix of kid stuff. Um, you know, if I'm in the gym, there might be some gangster rap. If I'm focusing at the desk, it might be some binaural beats. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah, it's a real mix. The yeah. algorithms just oh. left you. <laughs> Let's, go. Let's leave that guy alone. Uh, favorite quote. Can pass. No, I, 
you know who Yogi Berra is? Sorry? Yogi Berra? No. <clears throat> so he's a you know, famous baseball manager, I think the Yankees maybe from the you know, 50s or, or before. <clears throat> and he was renowned for having these um, you know, quite funny, contradictory quotes like, you know, Baseball is ninety percent mental. Yeah, you know, the other half is physical. Oh yeah, sure. Um, but there's there's one I really like, which is, uh, and I think it's it actually makes a lot of sense. Is you can observe a lot just by watching. Because I think a lot of people don't take the time to to really watch, and whether that's internal or or what's going on around them, we're so caught up in you know, what's on the screen or what's. Yeah, you know, important to, to us for the next you know, moment in our life, whatever it is, that you don't just pay attention, you don't just watch, you don't just observe, hmm. um, even though it is one of those ones that people think is funny. Oh, yeah, you can observe a lot just by watching. It's obvious. <laughs> it's obvious. Yeah. Yeah, yeah go on. Um, most uh, must read book? Fiction or non fiction? Either. Okay. Both. So for fiction, I'll give you a, a nice, simple, quick one, which will be The Old Man and the Sea, okay. Hemingway. Yeah. Just love his you know, language. I think it's... The prose. The prose is just epic. And, and just to like actually enjoy reading prose is... I think it's a, a, a lost art or a lost pastime for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Um, on the, the non-fiction side, I'd say... Uh, Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers by Robert Sapolsky. Okay. Which is all about the stress response, which is where I live at the moment with my, my training and my coaching and my teaching. Yeah. And the basic premise is, you know, animals in the wild experience stress, but it's acute and it's for a very good reason to you know, get away from a predator mm-hmm. or whatever it is. We experience chronic ongoing stress because we live in our head and we live in the stories of, you know, why we're under threat when we're actually not. Awesome. Uh, most inspirational person in your life? Uh, my wife. Beautiful. Yeah. Beck? Yeah. I mean, um, Beck and Ryder are the, I draw inspiration from, from every day and, yeah. It's basically all there is to it. And one guest, famous or otherwise, that you think we should be interviewing? You'd probably be a pretty good chance of getting... Um, no, 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 that's not... No? Not, not even, like... No? Doesn't, don't care? Doesn't care. I don't care. Right. Throw them up. We're going to... Do you, do you know who um, William Truebridge is? No. So he's the current world record holder for the constant weight no fin freedive. So New Zealand guy. Constant weight no fin. Constant. What's constant weight mean? It means that whatever weight you start with on the surface, you take down with you and you bring back up. So you do can't. they do they weight themselves? You might need a bit of to get down. Yeah, into the ab- until it draws you down. Yeah, until okay. you get to a um, a depth where the pressure is pulls you back, pulls you down. Yeah, and then you got to then use but that you, weight to pull yourself up. Then you yeah, you got to carry it up. So, yeah. 102 meters. You can watch it on YouTube. Holy shit! Yeah. And how long did the, was that? Who who down for that? Not sure. Might be... There's no fins. No fins. So he's oh doing Lord. a... But, but once you, you start travelling at, at yeah. depth, it's... It's, uh, it's so mental, right? It has yeah. to be. It might be three, three or so minutes oh. of total dive. Um, that makes me want to vomit. Mm. Like, yeah. One thing to be in the pool and put your head up. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But yeah, okay. But yeah, some of the, the training that he's gone through and what he's explored um, to understand his his physiology and you know mindset, I think is is really incredible. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm I'm just a a weakened warrior when it comes to <laughs> <laughs> breath holding in the pool. Compared to that, yeah. Wowza. Um. All right. Well, I'll have to put that in the list. Um. Rich, thank you very much. We even get into we didn't even get into didn't touch techniques breath like. No specific work on what you do in ice baths or breath theory or anything. So maybe next time we can get into that. But I really appreciate um, your time and appreciate uh, 
uh, your influence in my life in the short term. I'm looking forward to tapping into more of that. My pleasure, mate. Great to be here. And yeah, when I got that update after day two, that was yeah one of the best days of my year. Just just knowing that what I could contribute had such a profound effect. I was like, oh, yeah, maybe I deserve a seat at the table in this in this game. So yeah, and yeah. I know you said that as you messaged that to me, and it's yeah. like. I wanted to hit you over the head. Like, of course you can do. <laughs> like, oh my gosh. Um, that comes back to confidence and self-worth. And um, But yeah, you're not only at the table, man. You need to, we need to be pushing this. So Let's own it. That's good. Thank you, mate. Well, that was Rich Burrows, colloquially known as Buzz. Um, he is an absolute legend and someone who... I wouldn't uh, have achieved what I have achieved without. Uh, and I think um, that conversation was a testament as to how knowledgeable he is and how amazing he is in this space. So uh, super lucky to have him on the pod uh, as one of our first guests and looking forward to uh, looking forward to having him on as a semi-regular to talk about all things mindset and uh, heart performance. We'll put all of Rich's information uh, in the show notes or the notes below, um, the book he recommended and everything else discussed in the pod as well for your reference and um, look forward to seeing you next time. Peace.